Uh, this is our 10th ambassadorial forum at Harvey Lab University. And I know that some of you have been here for many of these. I also want to welcome particularly those of you who are here for the first time. If this is your first visit to Bar Ilan University, I encourage you to come. We have an outstanding scientific faculty, social sciences, humanities, Jewish sciences, and uh, Jewish studies. And if I left anybody out, I apologize. There's a lot of activity here and a lot of representation of Israeli society and all its complexities and differences across the board religious and secular, uh, Israeli, Jewish, Israeli, Arab, Druze, Bedouin, our classes have the broad spectrum. And I think uh, in addition to the outstanding level of education, also the, the reflection of Israeli society and its all its complexities is something that's very central to Bar Ilan University. So please, for those of you here for the first time, consider this to be an opening. I will not claim to uh, attempt to visit all of your countries, particularly not all 28 members of the EU. but. Uh, I would certainly hope that you would all come to the various events, seminars, and for individual meetings in areas where we might be able to develop uh, and expand the types of cooperation that we have with uh, universities and, and uh, research institutes in many of your countries. When uh, Ruth Cohen and I, Ruth, are you still here? <coughs> when she went outside, she deserves a lot of uh, credit for it all the credit for having maintained this program and worked hard. When we first began at the end of the ninth uh, forum, almost, uh, I guess, nine months or so ago, to talk about what, we, what issues can we present to you as academics that you don't have access to on a daily basis in your diplomatic or other activities. What as a university can we provide? What sort of issues can we put on the table as Israelis? And we both quickly at that time, we're talking about and notice the, the importance of Russia for us in the political, diplomatic, and military um, activities that are taking place in our region. That was just before the, um, the use of chemical weapons, the large-scale use of chemical weapons that took place in August of last year. And then the American-Russian almost confrontation that took place afterwards. And it became clear clearer than it had been before that Russia was now very much had returned, was a major player 100 kilometers, 150 kilometers from where we sit today. Egypt and the ongoing change of governments and reorganization of Egyptian political and military society. I'm saying this somewhere between the academic and the diplomat. I'm going to be careful here. The change of regimes that took place. Russia also emerged as a significant player in that process. We have now the, uh, currently the head of the uh, Egyptian military, General al-Sisi, going to Moscow, weapons being ordered from Russia, not from the United States, a distinct chill in uh, Egyptian-American uh, relations, and that has very profound impacts for Israel whether it's in dealing with Sinai or dealing with regional issues, that's something that is of, of importance to Israel. Who are the players that are acting and what are their uh, roles, what are their interests, what are we likely to see? That's a big change. And that's one of the reasons that we call this the re-entry of Russia into the region. There's a very long, and I won't even pretend to go through the history of uh, Soviet and then Russian relations with Israel, with the countries in the region, but I just want to point out for those of you from an Israeli point of view, from what we teach our students, students that are too young to remember this period, Russia and Israel had a lot of cooperation at the very beginning for different reasons. In 48, Russia was quick to recognize and assist Israel. But then there was a very distinct chill, very distinct conflicts that took place in the relationship. Uh, and by 1967, Russia was the primary source of weapons for then, but certainly between 67 and 73 and later. The Soviet Union was the primary source of support for uh, Syria, for Egypt, for the, the Arab coalition. The United States was Israel's main backer, and we even had not only where the wars fought between Russian, Soviet, and I gotta get you, Soviet and American equipment, but in some cases there were direct clashes during the war of attrition after the 67 war between Israeli pilots and Soviet pilots flying on behalf of the Egyptians. There was a very, very tense period in 67. 
Soviet Union broke off diplomatic relations with Israel. This was a zero-sum game. This was exactly the Cold War being played out right in our neighborhood. And there were no diplomatic relations and, and very uh, difficult uh, relations, uh, including a lot of uh, anti-Semitism and other forms of, of hostility that were part of that relationship in that period. With the change, the, the dismantling of the Soviet Union at the end, the uh, establishment of relations in 1991, I remember going to meetings just around the time of the Madrid conference after the Iraq War, and we had then uh, either a Soviet or a Russian flag, and the relations were, were restored, and that was, that was a major step. But Russia was not a major player. Russia was economically, politically, militarily, and in every other way, a very weak uh, actor in, in our region, going very quickly from, from the major strength to weakness. And for maybe 15 years or so, Russia, although formerly a member of the quartet, was really not <laughs> a significant influence in the region. There were some periods of discussions. There were uh, of, uh, sale of some Russian technology, some which went through, some which were stopped uh, in the area of, uh, for instance, uh, Iranian nuclear weapons uh, enrichment efforts. And uh, there were other points along the scale, but the, 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 the issues were relatively minor. But over the last few years, that's changed fundamentally. Support for Assad clashes with the United States over policy issues. As I mentioned, the relationship with Egypt. The opposition to American and European joint sanctions efforts vis-a-vis -vis Iran. Opposition, in some cases, uh, in a way that was compromised, the complex were managed, in some places, more direct opposition. All those issues meant that, as is Israelis, the Israeli political system, the diplomats, governments, and as academics, we had to become familiar with this new Russia, Putin's Russia. I think that's an accurate assessment uh, of uh, the, the, the way in which policies are made and the, the overall process by which Russia now has become a major actor in the region. So that was the thinking that we had. That was the logic that we thought we should uh, put this issue on the table. Uh, there are those who argue that the Cold War is back. As an academic, I was, I'm not a historian. I study politics. I don't claim to use the term political science. That's a problematic term. But to say that the Cold War is back is also very difficult to do. I say that as an academic, as an observer, because it's not the same. This is not an ideological clash between communist and, and capitalism, between uh, Washington and Moscow. It's more complex, it's more subtle. There are important economic issues and other issues there that uh, uh, Professor Regis will, I assume, talk about uh, when she makes her presentation. It's, it's very different. Hobbesian, yes. Struggle between great powers, conflicts of interest, but not zero sum. There is cooperation, and we see it most clearly in the case of the chemical weapons agreement on Syria where Israelis, perhaps more than anybody else, are watching to see every single shipment and how much is going to be left. I think one of the highlights of that period was that those of us who have uh, gas masks, all Israelis are supposed to have gas masks, chemical weapons, against chemical weapons, still from the days of Saddam Hussein. And those were being collected and recalled. But what happens if the chemical weapons from Syria stay there? What happens if that agreement is not implemented? To see the United States and Russia cooperate does mark an important change if that cooperation is maintained, given everything that else that's going on, including the Ukraine, of course, and other issues, that will be different than most of the period of the Cold War. So I'm raising a lot of questions. I'm not claiming to present a different kind of paradigm on this. But some of the questions that we've been asking in our uh, seminars and discussions and conferences. And with that background, I have the privilege to introduce our main speaker. Nadav Eyal, to Israelis, does not need an introduction. I confess that I'm an addict. Uh, Channel 10 News, can I say this out here? Channel 10 News presents the most stimulating and interesting and usually broad range uh, points of view. Uh, yeah, also on international issues <coughs> that uh, across the Israeli media. And uh, Nadav Eyal is known to many of us uh, on that basis. He's had a distinguished career, uh, also in the academic realm, uh, and uh, 
he has a lot to add to this. So rather than wasting his time and your time and doing more presentation, I, I will uh, invite uh, Nadav to, to join us. And thank you again for agreeing to Thank you very much for this kind presentation. I'm really sorry that you didn't manage to speak with Anna Azari, uh, Ambassador Anna Azari, uh, because of this uh, strike in the Foreign Ministry. Uh, she is indeed a great expert of Russia and uh, would no doubt uh, a bigger expert than I am to Russian uh, politics and Russian policy, and that's, that's the minus. But the plus is that I'm a journalist, so unlike diplomats, I can speak uh, uh, very, very uh, frankly uh, on issues that are somewhat complex and Israeli decision makers and diplomats do not want to tackle in the way or in front of the diplomatic community in the way uh, that we can. Uh, so I, I will speak briefly and, and will give a, sort of an analysis which I hear from Israeli decision makers and then and I know this would be helpful for you. Uh, I've learned that in many, many lunches over the years. I will say what Israeli decision makers, real senior decision makers in Jerusalem, how they perceive the issue at hand. And the issue at hand is, of course, the rise of Russian influence in the Middle East, what some would call a diplomatic offensive by Putin's Russia, or a return of the Russian influence sphere to our region. This is the issue. And we have seen the prime of the achievements of Russian diplomacy in the year 2013 with the agreement that Joe mentioned, the agreement to disarm Assad's regime from chemical weapons. I should add that we know now uh, that the Syrians are not fulfilling this agreement in the pace that the US and the EU saw at the beginning, or at least this is how Israelis are seeing it. I didn't hear this from uh, European or American officials, but I did hear it from Israeli decision makers. They are disappointed. I won't say, you know, disappointed to the point of, of anger, but they are disappointed from the pace, and they're saying that the Syrians understand full well that this agreement to disarm them gives them a sort of a diplomatic, maybe more than a diplomatic shield against an international intervention, and from that reason, they're dragging their legs in doing, in fulfilling that agreement. But there is no doubt that the agreement for itself as a diplomatic achievement was indeed a moment of reckoning for the West in the sense of the rise of Russia and specifically of Vladimir Putin as a major player. And he indeed was further along the way elected, you know, most, most influential leader in the world. And that is for itself quite a statement coming from Western newspapers to a leader of a country which is really no match in economic terms, and you'll hear furthermore about economy if you compare it to the United States or even are they to China. We know or we, we, we know the the basic background of the Soviet influence in this region. Uh, the Soviet influence in this region, um, probably since the 1970s, has been declining. Since 1974, that's the date that usually is being chosen, and that is because of Egypt leaving that alliance with Moscow and choosing Washington as its strategic ally. And that was the first blow to Soviet-Russian influence in this region since the 1940s, and that continued on together with the decline of the Soviet Union. And of course, Beginning the 1990s and the crumbling, the disappearance of the Soviet Union, uh, we've seen still countries in this region uh, dependent on Russian uh, arms sales, for instance, Algeria or Libya or Syria or, in a sense, Iraq prior to 2003. 
But in terms of spheres of influence, in terms of leveraging power, the Soviets and the Russians after them were not major players. Now, we've seen in, in recent years, with Ru Russia stabilizing internally, with the ability of Mr. Putin to centralize his power, uh, and with a very specific and coherent policy towards the Middle East, a rise of Russian power even before the Syrian crisis. And in latest years, we've seen two uh, big arms deals, which signaled that Russia is back in the big game, and that game of arms deal should not be seen only as complementing a diplomatic process. The arms deals that Russia is handling and uh, advancing is a major part of its policy, and some would say it is its policy. I think that's too much to say. 27% from Russian arms export go to this region. It's very important to the Russians to expand that. We've seen a $2 billion arms deal with Egypt, signed, if I'm not mistaken, in January. They're speaking about more deals. That's not a very big arms deal, mind you. Of course, that's not a strategic arms deal, but that's a, a, a very definite signal to Washington. We've seen in 2012 a very surprising billion dollar deal with Iraq, which you would expect that that government would only align itself with the US and be controlled by US arms deal. And we've seen Russia do a whole lot of other stuff. For instance, having an Arab RT station, sort of an, uh, an Arab version of Russia Today, broadcasting in Arab uh, to, to this region. And, and this, is made, this might be the most important point, together with Russia's ambitions, and more than results for now, these are ambitions to this region, we of course have seen um, a, a slow and then a fast withdrawal of American presence in the region in different levels, both in terms of the withdrawal from Iraq and afterwards the idea that Egypt might not be the strategic ally that it is. But as mentioned before, uh, and, and then after, after the 2013 deal, there were a lot of publications that the Russians are back. This is again a bipolar game. We have an Eastern influence fighting a Western influence in this region, and the whole kind of let's talk Cold War uh, language. This is, of course, very simplistic. And Russia is not the USSR. It doesn't have the same powers, it doesn't have the same population, it doesn't have even the same economic power. And I don't think, and I'm complimenting the Russians, that it has the same aspirations. I think that it is much more realistic than what was the USSR. And of course, it is not an empire, in some senses, like the American empire. And by using the term empire, I'm not using it negatively. It is simply not an empire, a modern empire. And if you look at the results, if you look at the past 20 years, the Russians have lost Iraq, which was a major client state and sphere of influence. They've lost, and that was in 2003, when they lost it completely. They lost Libya. Syria is weakened and isolated, and even if Assad will remain in power, it will remain so. And the Arab Spring has led major populations in the Middle East away from Russia in the sense of those who, at least at the beginning, were aspiring for something, were not aspiring for any model which resembles Putin's Russia. They were aspiring for a liberal democracy of some sorts or liberal dreams, or liberal aspirations, in some sense. And, of course, its support for Syria is a support for a minority, for a, an alliance between Shia and Alawi minorities, which is 
really, if you sort of count the numbers, insignificant in the Middle East, and specifically in the Near Middle East. So it's very standing with Syria today, alienates the Sunni majority. We know that Bandar Ben Sultan went to Moscow, uh, if I'm not mistaken, more than a year ago, and suggested that Saudi Arabia would buy $15 billion of arms from Moscow if Moscow will abandon its alliance with Assad. It did not do so. And in a sense, this resolve, this coherent policy, is, is bringing uh, Mr. Putin some credit in this region. Because it's definitely not the same policy that we've been seeing from Washington, which is incoherent, completely incoherent. And for that reason, the Sunni countries, both uh, in the Gulf, although Mr. Putin has visited there, and in Saudi Arabia, different regions, and in Egypt, they treat Russia with a very uh, distinct suspicion. Israel is, of course, very interested in that suspicion. We've seen the policy. Uh, it, it, we used to say in Israel that uh, Putin, not only in Israel, that Putin is an enigma. And there was this philosophy of non-intervention, of sovereignty, rights of states. But the truth is that he has been completely exposed in his policy, and he, in a sense, has been very upfront with it. Mr. Putin doesn't hold a political philosophy as Israelis see it. He holds a very basic, realistic perception of international relations. He aims to retain, increase, and expand Russian power. He will use all leverage of power to do that, including, if needed, funding violence. He does that extensively. He uses both soft power and hard power. In that sense, he's a more sophisticated player in a more sophisticated world than the Soviet Union. And he does that in a very successful, elaborate, and well-planned way, much more than the Americans. And he is absolutely resolved not to lose more client states or more spheres of influence. Now, if he needs to preach non-intervention in Syria, he will do that. If he needs to occupy cream in Ukraine, he will do that too. There is no philosophy, there is no line here, there is no ideal here, there is only the interest of retaining <coughs> and increasing, expanding Russian power. It's very simplistic, but this is what Mr. Putin has been doing. And some of the countries which are represented here have been pointing that out to Mr. Putin in the latest months. That after years of preaching to the West about non-intervention in Syria, he's been doing the same. But the truth is that they know, that the Russians know, that this was just diplomatic, pub how do you call it, public diplomacy? Which actually means PR. That was just PR. Everybody knows that. And everybody knows that the Russians know that, that they know that that it was all an elaborate PR stunt. Israelis look with worry at this influence. Israeli decision makers are worried because they understand that we are better off, that Israel is better off in a universe controlled by the United States spheres of influence. This is, again, quite simplistic, but this is how they perceive it. In the United States, Israel has many assets. Some would say that its biggest asset is, of course, the Israel lobby. I argue that that's not true. Its biggest asset in the US is a perception of the American population that sees Israel as an ideological liberal twin as a democracy in a sea of dictatorships, as a Western country, as a country which is an, an ally. Now, this does not come. It, it might be grown by, it might be stimulated by an Israel lobby, 
but it does not come from that Israel law. It comes basically from both countries being, in a sense, quite similar. And Israel, in recent generations, has become much more similar and aims to be much more similar. Like the US, it aims to be an American model of everything today. And because of that, we've seen that Israel today is in, in the peak of its popularity in the United States. And it doesn't really matter in what, in, in, in what party, including Democratic Party, including the Democratic Party. So as far as, as, as decision, Israeli decision makers are concerned, it's very simple. We would rather the Americans have as much stake in this region as they can, because we can influence the Americans better than we can do to the Russians. And the Russians have always been more realistic in addressing this region than the Americans. Realistic, I'm, I'm speaking in the international relations language. That means that if they see here uh, a few hundred millions of Arabs and a few <coughs> millions of Israelis, they would probably go and support the interest of the, the hundreds of millions of, of Arabs uh, and, and an alliance with Israel based on some sort of idealism doesn't exist from two reasons. First of all, it negates the realistic perception even of the Soviet Union, but also of Russia. And secondly, they simply do not have this idealistic twinning with Israel, and they never did have. And for that reason, when Israeli decision makers see that Mr. Putin is chosen by Western journalists to be the most influential person in the world, they're very frustrated. They're frustrated from Mr. Obama's lack of action, his incoherence, the way that he tackled the Arab Spring, the way that he did not recognize, as they see it, the dangers of the Arab Spring, the way that he treated Mr. Mubarak at the time. Might I remind you that the Islamic Brotherhood in Russia was defined a terror group in 2003. And almost immediately after Mr. Morsi was elected, Mr. Lavrov traveled to Cairo. No problem at all. They had a history with the Muslim Brotherhood. But they had no problem doing that, exactly as they had no problem aligning themselves in recent months with the Kurds in Iraq, and in the meantime, signing an arms deal with the Iraqi government. This policy is a policy that worries Israelis, Israeli decision makers, because it might lead to a condition in which it will cripple Israel's ability to act on two levels. First of all, on a very physical level. If Iran will get those S-300 missiles, that might be very problematic for addressing and planning a possible preemptive strike against Iran. The, these things have been published. So Israel has been working tirelessly for years to prevent that. Mr. Netanyahu has asked repeatedly, Mr. Putin, not to sell those rockets. And the answer he got is, we didn't sell them yet. We didn't sell them yet. Nothing was delivered yet. That was the best that he could take from these meetings. So physically, the rise of Russia, either by selling sort of arm, arms, specific arms, or by having such a vested interest in places like Russia, Syria or places like Iran, might simply tie the hands of Israel from actually doing things that it might do. We have seen Russian presence in this region. It was mentioned. Israel will, you know, do whatever it can not to hurt Russian personnel. It knows the costs. And the, the, the Russian uh, presence, even the Russian military presence in Syria, has expanded in recent years and months. The other level is, of course, diplomatic. Russia is having a flirt with every rival that Israel has in this region whether it be Iran, the newly formed Iraq, which we do not speak about 
a lot, but it is a major area of influence of the Iranian regime today. The Syrian regime, which is, as far as Israel is concerned today, is completely better than those jihadi Sunni organizations operating them, but is still a major support, a major supporter of uh, Hezbollah, and of course Hezbollah itself, which is supported both by Iran and Syria, both are expanding their relationships with Russia. So if you look at this in terms of axis of power, spheres of influence, the Russians are strengthening by their presence traditional rivals of Israel. Now I know that this, is, this might sound very simplistic and I do not pretend to give you a full analysis which you will hear from these distinguished guests as to the relationships between the Russian policy and the truth of the matter, but I'm giving you the, the, the Israeli perception and I'm giving it to you unfiltered by diplomacy, PR, niceties, and all this. This is how they really see it. On the other hand, I would say something about Russia which is interesting in that sense. Russia has made itself into a position, has hold itself into a position in which it has a leverage power on negative players. That's saying a lot. It might be the only international power that has today leverage on negative players in this region, or countries that we perceive as negative players. Iran, which supports terror across the region, including here in Israel, supports Hamas, although it's a Sunni organization, Hezbollah, Syria, the newly formed Shia Iraq, and the only leader, world leader, which might influence these countries by the power of the relations that he has built, by the power of the isolation that is being coerced on these countries by the West, is Mr. Putin. So when Prime Minister Netanyahu wants to stop a Russian arms sale, he of course goes to Moscow. But he might want to go to Moscow also to ask Mr. Putin to pressure Mr. Assad not to deliver certain weapons to Hezbollah or else. And I presume he does that too. So Russia has an ability to influence those, I wouldn't say non-rational players, I think all players in this region, almost all players, may be taking out those jihadi organizations that are operating within Syria. All players in this region are rational. But these players are, as far as Israel is concerned, and I think as far as the West is concerned, and I think as far as the world is concerned, are negative players. And Russia holds some sway on them. And that's saying quite a lot today. And that's the reason Mr. Putin can deliver a disarmament deal from chemical weapons. So, in terms of pure international relations interests, Israel is playing a very complex game. It does not want to alienate itself from Russia. And I remind you, of course, that we have a million Israelis that are speaking Russian. And they do not necessarily align themselves, their culture, with the West. And they are very apparent, both here, and what is surprising is that they are very apparent with their connections, their family connections, their community, in Moscow, in St. Petersburg, and across Russia. And these Israelis would want Israel to have good relations with the Russian Federation. And that's also a political power. And on the other hand, Israeli decision makers know that they cannot have a confrontation with Russia's Putin like they had with the Soviet Union. That they need to keep relations at a very kept in a very good order. And for that reason, I don't think that even if you will look back, and you might look back a few a few years ago, you will not find 
an open criticism of Israeli decision makers in the level of Prime Minister, Defense Minister, or Foreign Minister against Mr. Putin or the Russian Federation, including on matters which are of the highest national interest priority for, for Israel, for Jerusalem, including on arms sales, even on the S-300. You will hear requests, but you will not hear demands or criticism. Neither you will hear them critical at Putin on his support for the Assad regime, even in the days in which Israel completely aligned itself with the American spin and openly said, Ehud Barak said that numerous times, in a few months Mr. Assad will fall, in a few weeks Mr. Assad will fall, the fall of Mr. Assad is imminent, that was of course psychological war, and a western spin, very well planned, and Mr. Barak did that in the request of the Americans. But you will never hear Mr. Barak say, Mr. Putin is supporting a dictatorship, which uh, is committing war crimes, and so forth. Israel wants an open line to Moscow, understanding that Moscow holds the sway today on those players which are negative players. Understanding also that Moscow's interest and spheres of influence, even economically, even in terms of funds which are invested in this country by Russian oligarchs, Russian oligarch, a Jewish Russian oligarch, is to an extent that you do not want to disconnect yourself from Moscow. The same way that we have seen a few weeks ago uh, someone uh, leaving Downing Street 10 with that paper not folded carefully, saying first priority for the EU sanctions on Russia, making sure that the city of London doesn't lose its status as an international financial center. The same way, in that sense, these pressures, these economic pressures, are starting to show some influence here in Israel. So to sum up, the overall view of, of Russia's rise of influence in the Middle East is negative for Israeli decision makers. Russia is aligning itself with everything that negates the West. And Israel is computed for many years now to deliver itself into the interests, or aim itself into the interests of the West, and specifically the United States, not only because it's a client state, but also mostly because the United States and Israel are real allies. This alliance is real. And for that reason, Israeli decision makers would want this rise of prominence of Russian power to slightly fade, and if possible, completely fade away. In a sense, these publications making the impression, creating the impression that Russia today is as powerful as the Soviet Union, was becoming powerful, very powerful in this region, neglect the facts. And the facts are that it holds only two client states in this region. One is Syria, embattled in a brutal civil war. And the other one is Algeria. That's what it has left now. Egypt, Iraq, these are speculations and signals, nothing more. On the other hand, knowing that the influence, the general influence is negative and we would rather have Americans much more present in this region, Israeli decision makers want an open line to Moscow, knowing that the only international player today that can leverage its power on negative players for Israel is Mr. Putin himself. And knowing that they need to act very realistically and very cautiously, and as you well know, caution is not a trademark of Israelis. But they try to do that too. Thank you very much. If I were to uh, try to sum up uh, Nadav's presentation, I would remind you of a, a saying, it comes from the Talmudic period uh, that Jews have been using for probably close to 2,000 years, Kabdeo Bechashdeo, 
translates you should honor, a little bit of caution in that word, but you should also be concerned. You should move cautiously. Uh, that's probably as close as we get to Ronald Reagan's uh, trust but verify. Or maybe Palmerston's uh, adage that uh, he said, in those days, England has no permanent friends, only interests. And that's, I think, the way that both the policies that Putin's Russia is, are pursuing and the way in which the Israeli decision-making process and, and the uh, much broader public discussion about the implications are looked at in Israel. Our second speaker is a close colleague and a friend. It's hard to introduce friends, and I have two friends to introduce. Uh, I'll say that uh, Vladimir Zev Khani, who's a colleague of mine in the political science department at Bar Ilan University for many years, we've kind of lost him for a little while. He's been seconded, as they say in, uh, in Britain, to be the uh, chief scientist at the Ministry of Immigrant Absorption. He's also a fellow at the University's Rappaport Center for Studies of Assimilation and Strengthening of Jewish Vitality. That's an interesting combination. He's got a, a tremendous number of accomplishments. He was also my uh, first guide in Moscow. And that was about 10 years ago we were there. And we were there for a discussion, a high-level discussion, on the Iranian nuclear program and proliferation. That was 10 years ago. And there was a Russian position there, and that Russian position hasn't really changed very much, or I should say Russian positions. We heard different positions from different interests in those days. Uh, he got his PhD in history from the Institute of, for African Studies at the uh, uh, Soviet Academy of Sciences, and a postdoctorate at the Institute for Russian and Soviet Studies at St. Peter's College at, in Oxford, and many, many other accomplishments, which uh, are too lengthy to, uh, to list. But I will say, most importantly, he's a friend and someone who many of us rely on to present an analysis of what's going on inside, if not inside Putin's head, at least inside of Moscow. So thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Gerald, and thank you all for joining us this morning. Uh, I'm represented with their, my two capacities: first, as the chief scientist in my government position, and second, in my university position. So I would ask you to refer to the second one. So what I'm going to say is actually my personal opinion, and not the opinion of the Israeli government. Uh, okay, uh, I'm going to say a few words uh, on, uh, from the little bit different point of view, uh, meaning what we call the public diplomacy, or second track, whether uh, there is a sort of a correlation of intermural, if we are talking about mutual relations, Israel and the Russian Federation, uh, from the public point of view. Uh, it was already mentioned by Duff that here in this country we have like one million uh, uh, Russian-speaking uh, Jewish and non-Jewish community, which came recently, from within the recent 25 years, in addition to more than 170,000 of those who came from the, the Soviet Union uh, in 1970s and early 1990s. Well, uh, to be exact, something like 1 million and 10,000 are with us today, meaning that those, or both those who were born in the Russian-speaking families and those uh, but minus those who passed away, and those, something like more than 100 or 20,000, uh, that left Israel, uh, some of them for the West and some of them back to Russia and the former Soviet Union. So at the moment we have uh, about 55,000 strong Israeli, I'm talking about Israeli, not just Jewish community, in the Russian Federation itself. More of them, most of them are concentrated in Moscow and St. Petersburg. So, of course, these people influence each other. They influence their, uh, the area, uh, the society they live within. And, of course, here I also agree with Nadab, uh, they may impact uh, the local policy concerning the other side. Uh, if we will add to that the growing tourism between two countries, uh, as far as, in, as, as I'm updated, uh, in 2013, uh, we enjoyed having something like 390,000 tourists just from Russia itself, in addition to uh, uh, quite a substantial number of those who came from other Soviet, former Soviet republics. And something like between 70 to 80,000 Israeli tourists visits, uh, visited Russia last year. Uh, overwhelming majority of them, of course, uh, were people from, uh, uh, who came on family visits, 
meaning to visit their family and friends in the places where they came from here, but also businessmen and, uh, and uh, uh, journalists and politicians and persons who are just uh, Israeli terrorists of non-Russian origin who are interested to understand uh, where uh, the, uh, much of the Israeli ethos came from. Uh, as we know, uh, uh, Israel and Russia uh, are not just countries from each other. It's very interesting to, to follow uh, how the situation or position of Russia is presented on, uh, uh, in Israeli mass media and in the public opinion. So sometimes we expect from Russia to do and to say more or less than we could expect from uh, other countries, for instance, North American and European countries. Because Israel is somewhere deeply inside the Israeli ethos. As we know, uh, they, their founding fathers of the state of Israel, they came from the pale of Jewish settlements in the former Russian Empire. Uh, so as uh, uh, one, of our, uh, one of the first uh, Israeli prime ministers said, uh, we read in Russian and discussed the issues in Hebrew. Uh, so in, in some way, uh, it stayed until now. So Russia uh, is uh, very important as an image, as an element uh, of uh, the public wealth region of the traditional Israeli establishment, what we call the first Israel. Uh, on, the, uh, on the other hand, it shouldn't be taken into account the fact that from, uh, 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 for Israelis, uh, Russia for many years was the country uh, which had it, the so-called Eastern Bloc against the Western Bloc, which Israel belonged to. And from this point of view, uh, um, the Israeli public, uh, as was probably the Russian public, uh, had to see each other as enemies. Uh, on the other hand, it's very interesting to see that uh, many of public opinion polls uh, that we can see uh, here in Israel show that Russia was never uh, accepted uh, by the most of Israeli public opinion as a clear enemy. Uh, so it was clear by the Israeli public, as far as I understand it's clear even now, uh, that uh, there are sort of uh, misunderstandings or different interests uh, related to uh, different strategic positions, uh, uh, geostrategic positions, and different interests of uh, uh, Russian and Israeli government. Israel is a part of the Western world, but there is nothing personal in there, or uh, there is very little personal in there. And that uh, also worked in the recent years, uh, which uh, um, uh, we consider uh, uh, as a period of uh, bigger closure. I mean, coming together, coming close to each other. Uh, as, here, as, we, uh, as far as we can see, uh, uh, the recent activities in Moscow uh, and Jerusalem toward this, uh, I would define it, uh, uh, Israeli-Russian uh, track. Uh, from this point of view, uh, we can talk about not just uh, uh, the, the presence of the Israeli community in Russia and the Russian community in Israel, but also talk about uh, the changing of mutual understanding of uh, Israeli government and the Russian government. Uh, we know that for many years, uh, the um, official Israeli establishment uh, didn't see Russia as the major threat or among the major aims of their foreign policy activities. Uh, much, uh, at least not so important as relations with the United States, Canada, uh, 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 West, uh, Western Europe, and of, uh, or even uh, uh, Arab world or uh, Eastern and Southeastern Asia. Uh, the visits of uh, uh, Israeli government officials to Russia were sporadic. Uh, actually, they aimed uh, or discussed some uh, peripheral issues that were already settled vis-a-vis uh, -vis Americans or Europeans. Uh, uh, they also, it also included the promotion of al meaning Jewish repatriation resettlement in Israel, uh, on from time to time to, to settle some hot points, and nothing more than that. And of course, uh, on the eve of the each elections, it was very important to some piece of that Israeli politician uh, to get a, 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 how you call it, a photo, op, a photo opportunity in Moscow in order to be seen uh, on these uh, Russian federal channels also in Israel. It was expected, it was seen, as uh, Nadav also presented it here, that good relations in Russia means also good relations with the Israeli Russian speaking community, which is also important before the elections. Uh, I might say that it's not necessarily so, uh, and uh, if I will give you a, a few figures uh, a little bit later on at the end of my presentation, you will see that it should be taken with some sort of a, uh, how would you put it, uh, uh, not to take it for granted, uh, uh, this approach. Uh, the situation actually, if I'm called back to the second point, meaning the activities of uh, 
uh, of the Israeli and Russian government on this track and how these activities impact the, the public opinion in Russia and in Israel, I would say that the situation changed dramatically after 2009. Meaning the previous uh, uh, period of uh, the, in the previous government and the current government, we see the, the uh, drawing of the activities on the, on the track of mutual relations. So uh, visits from Israel to Moscow uh, became non-sporadic. It became uh, uh, systematic, I would say, uh, on, on, on the highest level, starting from the president and prime minister and uh, different ministers and government officials. Uh, we had a visit of Mr. Putin here and uh, cancelled visit of Mr. Medvedev and once again visit of Mr. Putin. Uh, so for Russia it became much more important to be here. Um, it, it, it became even more important uh, after the start of the Syrian crisis, which uh, actually, I wouldn't say ruined, but much more uh, undermined uh, relations of Russia uh, with, the Arab, with the Sunni Arab world. Uh, and uh, some of the experts in Moscow told me, experts pretty close to uh, so-called uh, their decision-making circles in the Kremlin is said uh, that we are now surprised to have a situation when Russia's relations with Israel is much better than it with any of the Arab countries. The situation this time is uh, improving uh, concerning the re-establishment of the relations with Egypt and some other states, but still uh, we have uh, we face a new phenomena which we didn't have before. Um, we are talking about uh, cooperation in different spheres like uh, uh, infrastructure, uh, strategic partnerships, space, uh, intelligence, and so on and so forth. Of course, uh, the potential of mutual relations is much higher uh, uh, than, it, uh, than it's going on now, but uh, the trend uh, uh, is important at the moment. Um, uh, the third point, uh, I have four points, okay, Gerald? So another five minutes. So uh, 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 the third point is uh, 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 the influence concerning, meaning the, the, the mutual understanding, the so-called Israel and Russian in, in intermirrors from the public point of view. So the third point is the position of uh, so-called expert community. Uh, journalists, researchers, uh, decision makers, uh, they see the situation, they make their conclusions, and they try to explain their conclusions to Israeli and Russian public. Uh, from this point of view here in Israel, we probably could talk about two schools. The, 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 I would define them as uh, Kremlin optimists and the Kremlin pessimists. Uh, the Kremlin pessimists say uh, that in, in spite of everything, uh, Russia uh, will always be on the so other side of the barricade. Russia is demanding uh, to return, uh, is requesting to return it, its status as a superpower. Uh, from this point of view, as a superpower, it comes, uh, comes back to the Middle East. It has its own interests. So, from this point of view, Russia will be, uh, if not an enemy, but a rebel of the United States. And since the United States is a strategic, strategic partner of Israel, we will be on this, uh, in the different political camps. From this point of view, uh, relations in Russia could be, uh, uh, should develop, but they should be conditional. Meaning, we do what we do, if Russians would do or not do what they do or not do. Okay, meaning like uh, we will buy Russia gas only in the situation in, in, in the day if they will not sell the nuclear technology to Iran and so on and so forth. Uh, the Kremlin optimists say uh, they come from another point of view. Uh, they suggest the following concept. Uh, it's unproductive to make a pressure on Moscow. Russians will do what they will do and we have to think uh, what we can do together. Uh, the points which we are unable to agree should be uh, put out of brackets, but in the brackets to bring the spheres and the fields what we, uh, in which we are able to cooperate. Uh, from the so-called uh, optimistic, uh, meaning Kremlin optimistic point of view, uh, uh, Russia comes back to the Middle East uh, in the Middle East, not as a bearer of the spe specific ideology like it was in the Soviet Union times, but just uh, uh, as a bearer of specific economic, political, and geostrategic interests. Uh, that means uh, nothing personal, just business. Uh, if I'll come back to uh, what also uh, uh, Dov said, that uh, for Russia it's very important to sell their arms here in the Middle East, I can strengthen it by saying that at the moment, uh, the industrial export, meaning the uh, uh, machinery and uh, 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 machine product, uh, machinery production uh, 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 goods, uh, 
uh, in jury or share only 6% in the whole Israeli export. Of this 6%, 80% is the arms export. And of this arms export, about the half comes to the Middle East. So from the, if, if you understand that, we should uh, take into account that here is the Russian interest and we have to, uh, we have to do something about that. Um, uh, and uh, uh, finally, my last point, uh, coming back to the Israeli and Jewish community in Russia and Russian Israeli community here, uh, I've, I've promised and I'm going to do that. Uh, I will tell whether really uh, uh, Israeli Russian speaking community is so close to Russia as it is uh, uh, normally people think about it. Uh, recently, we've done um, uh, uh, a couple of years ago, we did an opinion poll uh, asking uh, what uh, Israel should do in concern of Russia. That means, uh, what is your opinion? We asked Russian-speaking Israelis. At the same time, uh, the Levada Center, the, the leading uh, public opinion center in Moscow, uh, asked uh, the Russian public what they think uh, about Israel. Uh, just a few figures, and for, for that I'm going to complete my presentation. Uh, okay, so uh, uh, about 4% of Israeli Russian-speaking public believe that Israel should reorient is strategic interest toward Russia uh, stopping cooperation, strategic cooperation with the United States. Uh, since there, uh, the far percent, as you know, is somewhere in the magic of uh, in, in the margins of uh, statistical mistake. So probably most people don't believe in that. Uh, on the other hand, uh, about 27 percent said that Russia, Russia's interest will be always will be opposite to Israel. So it's better to step aside of that country. Uh, some 13% uh, believe that uh, uh, Russia should be equally far or equally too close uh, to all their uh, world superpowers. But about a half, that means more than about 45%, believe uh, that the United States should be a strategic partner of Israel, but at the same time, Israel should be close with Russia in the, in the points where it's possible to be close to each other. What Russians think about Israel? Uh, of course, Russian public is very much influenced by the federal, so-called federal TV channels. Uh, they're talking about two parties, which now in Russia, uh, in the Russian public, uh, means party of TV uh, and party of internet. Uh, party of internet is more liberal, and majority of the Russian part uh, of the of uh, the uh, of the Russian public, which is the audience uh, of TV, are actually much more conservative. So the Levada Center. Um, they actually asked uh, all these different groups of the population. And what is interesting there? Uh, give me a second. I'll, I'll have this res I, I have this result somewhere. Yeah. Um, uh, the uh, opinion poll, which was done in the 45 areas uh, of the Russian Federation, showed that in 2000, uh, 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 that overwhelming majority of the Russian public uh, don't consider Israel to be an enemy at all. Opposite to Iran, Afghanistan, United States, Georgia, Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia. So this group of countries are enemies, and Israel is not. Uh, uh, well, 69% uh, of the questioned Russians uh, declare their positive relation to Israel. So, uh, to make the long story short, if the governments are unable to agree, the public is able. Thank you so much. Thank you.